you turn back now to that chapter we read, Romans chapter 8. And this evening, as we seek to prepare ourselves for a communion Sabbath, we will look again at words we find reading at verse 33. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. <clears throat> now this well-known chapter is where the Lord's people often turn to to find encouragement and comfort. Someone has said that if the Holy Scriptures were a ring and uh, the epistle to the Romans its precious stone that chapter 8 would be the sparking point of that jewel. It is so central and focused and so important indeed in the scriptures. Now in this chapter we read of the two intercessions. There is the intercession of the Holy Spirit. Verse 26, may help us our infirmities, we not but pray for what we ought, but the Spirit makes intercession for us, which groan, with groanings which cannot be uttered. And throughout the chapter, we see much brought before us of the enabling of the Holy Spirit and by the Holy uh, Spirit delivering us from what we were and to what we should be now. You, it's amazing and I, I only as going through this again, I've been read it often enough as you all I'm sure, but uh, there's around 20 times in this chapter alone where the Spirit of God is mentioned. And that again tells us something about uh, the focus here. So we see that the importance of the Spirit in intercession and the importance of the Holy Spirit also uh, brought before us in his enabling, his enabling power and delivered us from our sinful nature, as he said. So the Spirit does in the life of the believer what the law could never uh, do. But there's also, of course, the intercession of Christ. It is Christ that died, yea, rather is risen again, who is at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. So we see the emphasis then in this chapter and in these verses, particularly I'd like to look at this evening. The emphasis in these verses of our security in Christ. And that again, friends, really, I suppose, uh, should be what we'd like to think about tonight if we are preparing ourselves for sitting at the Lord's table. This is our security that is resting upon Christ. And Christ lays the ground for, of course, for our justification uh, through what he has done. That's how we can be secure because of what he has done. You remember earlier on in Romans chapter 5, it speaks about, Therefore, as by the offence of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. By one man's disobedience, many were sinners. By the obedience of one, many be made righteous. And what are you tonight here, Christian, but a righteous one? One that the Lord has blessed, one that the Lord has saved. Isn't that your own hope here uh, tonight above everything else? And friends, as we do, look, and as I said, preparing yourselves for a time of uh, fellowship and communion at the Lord's table, it is profitable for us to remind ourselves anew of what Christ has done for us. Now, of course, that should not just be done at a time of communion. In our lives, if we are Christians, that should never be before us. But here tonight, to particularly then, focus as we must do and should do at a communion time 
upon Christ and what he has done in our room and in our stead. And that way to be encouraged in our own souls. Who is he then that condemneth? So first of all, the challenge, if you like, that is here. The challenge. Verse 33, who shall lay anything to the charge of God elect, God's elect? Beginning of verse 34, who is he that condemneth? A rhetorical questions, I suppose, but questions where no answer in a sense expected. It is obvious uh, what should be said considering what is said previously in the chapter regarding the Lord Jesus Christ. Now friends, whatever the enemy of our soul says, and you and I know very well that he usually says much to us, and he usually tempts us in many different ways, but whatever he seeks to say to us, especially at a communion time like this, the Lord's people are already justified and they cannot be condemned. So the question, who is he that condemneth? The apostle has given us, of course, the answer. And you and I know sometimes that we can under attack of Satan. But you see, to the Lord's people, oh, he can attack. And he does. But he is like a dog that is chained. He can bark at us. He can frighten us even. But he cannot separate us from Christ. And that is our hope tonight. That is surely what is your hope, I hope, pray, and mine. You see, the Lord's people, what are you? You're already justified. And if you're justified, there is no condemnation. You cannot be condemned. And Christian, having been justified, there can be, as we have at the very beginning of the chapter, there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Who is he that is condemned? Who shall separate us? Well, you know the answer. And what an encouragement that is for us to know that for ourselves tonight, above everything else. We are justified in Christ. So the apostle asking this question here, in other words, if you like, he said, it is ludicrous for any to suggest that you, Christian, having been saved, could now be condemned. And that's a wonder in itself, is it not, to us? If the Lord has saved us, to know that we cannot anymore be condemned. How could the one who has justified you, Christian, how could that one possibly change his mind and now condemn you? It cannot happen. It will not happen. And you can be comforted in that tonight. You may have had many difficulties, and you may have many questions. You may be examining yourself, as of course we all should, especially at times such as this. But there is no condemnation. Whatever the challenge is, the question comes to you in different ways. The Lord who has justified you, he will not now condemn you. Indeed, speaking with reverence, he cannot condemn those he has already justified. He cannot and of course will not do it. Well, you know yourselves, Simes, what it's like to be under the attack of the world, the flesh and the devil. Of course you know that. But you see, who knows that most and maybe nobody else knows it and understands it but the Christian. It's the Christian who is under attack. It's the Christian that knows the world, the flesh, and the devil, and that conviction that can come often to us. But you see, friends, even the accuser of the brethren, with all his power, he has no power to undo what Christ has done in your room and in your stead. He cannot. You who have been justified, you can no longer be condemned in any way whatsoever. You see, Christ has done all for you. He has made atonement for your sins. And whatever anyone suggests, whatever the devil or anyone else suggests, this is where your hope lies. And what has been declared concerning you? What has been declared concerning you? Well, is that not what we have here? You are justified. You are justified. It is God that justifieth. 
It is God in Christ that justifies. So you are safe in him and nothing shall separate you. And whatever the challenge comes, when the question is asked, you can know this for yourselves. And you tonight, Christian, if you are united to Christ here, you're already as safe as those who are already in heaven. Those who are in heaven tonight are no more safe than you are if you're in Christ here tonight. Well, I'm not saying that your situation is not different. Of course it is. And they are beyond the temptations and the difficulties and the trials and sin. But you're, there is an assurance, and we'll look at that later, that you can have and you can know this for yourself. And those who already, you think yourself, I'm sure every one of us here can think of those who have gone before us into glory. And sometimes, do you not, oh, do you ever wish, I'm sure you do at times, oh, I wish I was there. I wish I was beyond this world and all that is in it and its troubles. Just to be rid of my sin and all that is around me, of course. But as far as your eternal security is concerned, you're as safe tonight in Christ as those who already attained to glory. Or oh, you're not free from the challenges, as I said. But, and that will come from different sources. But you are no longer under condemnation in Christ. And that is the sure hope that we have. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect. It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, risen again, and is making intercession for us. That's what we have. So whatever the challenge is, in whatever way that it comes, it is not, of course, that there is nothing in this friend to be condemned in one sense. Oh, there is. You and I know the corruption still, sadly, of our own hearts. You and I know how much of the world is still clinging on to us, and we clinging on to the world. And the judge, in one sense at least, in one sense, and the stammer of saying, would have a right to do so, but for Christ. But for Christ. And having by faith cast yourself upon the Lord, and he having decreed your election of grace, however you feel here today, remember it is God that justifies. And if God justifies, who can condemn? Who can condemn? And whatever is thrown at you, whether from somebody around you, from the corruption of your own heart, this you have can be encouraged in. And even, friends, if the hordes of hell tonight cried out against you, they would never, in their multitudes, can have much to say about you. And they may be right in some of the things, but they cannot condemn, and you won't be. They have no power to do this. Oh, friends, what a saviour we have. What a wonderful Saviour we have to remember tomorrow. What a wonderful Saviour who has done so much for us. That is the hope we have, is it not? To remember anew what he has done. To remember anew the amazing power of his finished work. The power of that sacrifice that he gave to redeem such as you and I. You know, sometimes we look at people and we say, well, I can understand, in one sense at least, that this woman and that man, they were really always, they were nice, good people. And I can understand now that they're Christians, why they're saved. Oh, that's not why they were saved. And you might be saying, well, I can understand that as well, and, but to have mercy on me, on me not to condemn me, knowing my own sin. Do you know what that's like at times? I'm sure you do. But that's the wonder of the grace of God, that he was willing to do this, able to do it, and willing to do it in Christ. 
there what a glorious power then in that work in that work and in this justifying work now of course we know here the apostle Paul of all people from time to time had to face some horrendous challenges and who had to face some horrendous charges against him so that regarding where his hope lay and maybe yes here tonight itself I don't know some of you here and even those that I do know maybe you tonight you're hearing yourself the vilest suggestion seeking to condemn you coming from the very pit of hell seeking to charge you seeking to discourage you seeking you to drag you down what are you going to answer are you going to say oh well my good works I do so much my faith my love for Christ justifies me absolutely not absolutely not it is nothing of ourselves even the best of us it was never so what have we got it is God that justifies that's what you can say it is God that justifies me it is Christ that died for me that's the answer that's the only answer to the challenge in whatever way it comes so then we have that challenge here then that challenge that comes who is he that condemneth who shall accept us from love of Christ it cannot be because of him and what he has done for us. Well, secondly, looking more at the ground of that confidence. The ground of that confidence. Christ at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. The justified, as we said already, though plagued with sins in this world are nevertheless always and forever secure in Christ that's what our confidence lies or should I say that's who our confidence lies in in Christ as our saviour oh we're plagued with the sins in this world but we're secure in Christ so there is no as it were condemnation left to be put to our account because what has he done on the cross he has died for our sins he's taken the punishment he has been condemned as it were there in you Romans do you have that hope tonight do you have that assurance tonight do you have that confidence here this evening that that's how it is so whatever condition, not by the law, not by your conscience, or anything else, or anyone else. So friend, being in Christ, tonight, what else is true of you? You're indwelt with the Holy Spirit of God. That Spirit in you is proof of what Christ has done. Proof of many things. Proof of, of being predestinated to eternal life in Christ. Proof of every good thing for you tonight. So you see, the security of believers is the theme here. The security that we have in Christ. And so that we can go and remember his death in the way that we ought to. Knowing, I know that my Redeemer liveth. This is surely should be an encouragement to us and our confidence tonight. You see, the whole chapter here as you go through it is set out as a series of arguments if you like in support of having confidence in the God who justifies and the Christ who died support of confidence of, of assurance of salvation we can trace a chain through this chapter culminating even in these verses there's the foreknowledge of God there's the the predestination of God the called of God the justified by God and ultimately, ultimately the glorification that will be ours as well that's what we have. That's what can be confident of. When he begins the good work, he will continue it. He will not leave you to yourself. Friends, when we think that we are cleared in the court of God's justice from all our sins, 
What an astonishing thing that should be for any of us. Oh, there was a day that you knew nothing of that. There was a day when sin was just a little thing. But when you come to know Christ, you see the enormity of your sins and your past life. And yet here you are tonight, cleansed in the blood of Christ. What a wonderful thing that is. Why? Because of him. Not because you changed your life. Not because you stopped doing this and started doing that. Not for anything, but for him and through him and what he has done for you. And so he, having done what he has done, God's justice has been satisfied in your room and stead. And my friend, who dare then charge or condemn any believer if that is so? It is God that justifies. We are declared guiltless. What an amazing thing it is that you and I would be able to say such a thing tonight. What an amazing thing it is to have that confidence tonight that he, God, clears me, the guilty, in Christ. And Christ has done all that you and I could not do. And when he bore the penalty that we were due on that cursed cross. That's the Christ we will be remembering tomorrow at a communion time. To be able to know and to say, well, not only am I assured he died, but he died for me. Isn't that astonishing? Can you imagine yourself here tonight in Glasgow? Christ died, and many people will say, yes, I know that. But to be able to say, he died for me. That's the confidence, not an unholy confidence. That's what faith is about. All things obtained by him in his death are now bestowed upon all who believe in him. All for whom he died. Who are those for whom he died? Those he called. Those he chose. Those he justified. Here then is our ground of confidence is in Christ and in his finished work. So we see then the challenge, the ground of our confidence, and thirdly and finally, the assurance then that all of us can have. The assurance we can have. Professor John Murray speaks about Christ's redemptive work as that which undergirds any assurance we can have. The assurance particularly that Nothing, absolutely nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Absolutely nothing. You know, sometimes I think we don't emphasize that word enough. Nothing. When you think about what that means, what about this, that, doesn't matter. Nothing can. And that's the assurance that we can have. This is the hope that we have here. It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again. What is he saying there? It's an interesting way of putting things, is it not? It speaks about Christ died, but was raised from the dead, yea, rather, or else is risen. But there shall more convincing evidence that he died, but that he rose. You see, Christ died, yes, amen, thank the Lord for that. Yea, rather, that is risen again. It's in that resurrected Christ that tonight we have assurance. Oh, he died, and he had to die. And we look to that, and we have confidence that he died for us. But then the great assurance comes. For me, he rose again. And that's the assurance that you and I can have tonight here. He was delivered, as the apostle says elsewhere, for our offenses, and raised again for our justification. And so he's risen again, he emphasizes. This is the great thing, is it not? A risen Christ is the one that we have confidence in and assurance tonight. That's where our assurance, is that where your own assurance lies? You see, friend, you would have no assurance 
if you just believe that Christ died on the cross and then was buried. That would be no assurance. It's the living Christ and the risen Christ and the ascended Christ. Doesn't this very apostle, remember what he says elsewhere in 1 Corinthians 15, if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, our preach is vain, our faith is vain. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, you're yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. But we're not. And they are not. You know, friends, there are some doctrines that theologians and all of us can debate at times. There are some doctrines we can disagree on. Depends what our background is and what denomination we belong to, what church we belong to at times. There are some doctrines like that particularly. And in many ways they can be seen as secondary doctrines. But here is one friend that you should never give an inch on. That he is risen again. Yea, rather, that he is risen again. And if you truly know Christ as your saviour and intercessor, you'll never give an inch on that. Because that is where your hope is, that is where your assurance lies. The risen Christ. You see, for Paul, as for all believers, the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, they are inseparable. His death does not stand on his own. And isn't that what the Apostle really is laying stress on here? Yes, he died for your sins. Yes, he did. He took on himself the penalty due for our sins, for all his people. But then he rose from the grave triumphant. And if he has done that, and he has friends, oh, my dear friend, if you believe that, you have no reason not to be assured of your salvation tonight. Sometimes we think anyone claiming that kind of assurance is being presumptuous. Depends on what our background is, and some of us know something of that. But if you believe, as Scripture lays out for us and for you here, that he is risen again, that he is at the right hand of God making intercession, that's not being presumptuous. That's just taking God at his word. And what is to be taken God at his word? That's faith being exercised. That's what it's about for you. That's not an unholy boldness. That is a holy confidence with a holy assurance. Now, of course, our, our assurance is not based on anything of ourselves, not based on the level of our sanctification. Oh, is, uh, am I holy enough? It's not based on anything we have attained to. It's not based on anything that has to do with ourselves. But everything is based. My hope and confidence, my assurance is on the risen Christ. That he rose again for my justification. And be assured, O Christian, tonight. For here is the one to provide us remember in the Old Testament priesthood and later on others. But the great difference for this high priest, of course, is your high priest, that he finished the work. He has completed it all and is now at the right hand of God making that intercession. As we have it elsewhere in Hebrews speaks about how they had offered one sacrifice for sin, sat down on the right hand of God, having finished the work. Aaron never sat down. Aaron never sat down or any of the other priests when they were finished with their sacrifices. Offering, they weren't allowed to serve because there's more to come. But Christ finished and he sat, sat down at the right hand of God. So dear friends, then in conclusion, we see the question here, questions asked. Who shall lay any charge of God's elect? Who is he that condemneth? Well, what we have here answers itself in these verses. He ever liveth to make intercession for us. 
also makes intercession. Are you not glad tonight that he does? That he does. Friend, if you are saved tonight, you are safe as well. Being saved means being safe. And nothing shall separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Never forget that. And show it forth as you remember his death till he come. What does that itself tell you? Yes, he died, but he's coming again. That's what we're remembering tomorrow. Who is coming again? The one who died. Who, why did he die? For my sins. That's how it is for the Lord's people. In my Roman's dead, he died. So how can anyone lay anything to my charge if he has died and taken my punishment that I was due, that he stood in my Roman's stead, and now before the Father, God the Father, interceding for me. And it's not just either, friends, and this is the wonder of it all that we cannot enter into. It's not just, as it were, an occasional word of intercession when we are in particular difficulty or whatever. It's a continual intercession that never stops. And that's just as well, is it not? If it were not continual, because you know your own heart as I know mine. Oh, where would I be without that continual, unbroken intercession of Christ? What does that mean to you then tonight? Well, if you're a believer, it should mean everything to you. Or should I say, what does he mean to you tonight? If you're a believer, he means everything to you. Does he mean everything to you tonight? Well, if he does, my dear friends, prepare yourselves to sit at the Lord's table because you are justified by God. Let us conclude.